Okay, good afternoon everybody. My name is Charlie Nicklin, I'm Chief Executive of IAGRI and I'd like to thank you all for joining our November lunchtime lecture. Today I'd like to welcome Hugh Crabtree, founding member and owner of Farmex Limited. Farmex have been in business since 1980 and have become an award-winning market leader in ventilation and real-time monitoring of livestock buildings. Hugh is a graduate of Reading University, a director and fellow of IAGRI, and also a director and vice chairman of the National Pig Association, an organisation who have recently awarded Hugh a lifetime fellowship. Today, Hugh is going to give us an overview of his company and the work they've done over the last four decades. He will focus on the large amounts of real-time data available and look at the different approaches in gaining the full potential from this information for the businesses in question. Uh, just before Hugh starts, as normal, you're all currently muted. If you'd like to ask questions, please use the chat function at the bottom of your screen and then at the end of the presentation, we'll unmute you so you can ask in person. So over to you, Hugh. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, well, good afternoon, uh, fellow engineers. Um, thanks for coming to this lunchtime lecture. Um, I'm uh, <laughs> pleased to have been part of the pre-match discussion about sheep, but the uh, the beasts that I'll be actually um, mostly talking about, or my lecture will be related to, uh, 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 are pigs. So um, I hope you don't mind about that, Andy. Um, uh, so the title of the um, the title of the uh, lecture is "Can the Promise of uh, Information Communication Technology in Agriculture Be Realised?" And um, it's a bit of um, it's a bit of a con, really, because I'm going to chat to you for forty minutes or so. Uh, and then I'm going to beg the question um, as to how we can actually realise the value. I'm going to suggest a couple of uh, quite different approaches, but um, as you will learn, I've been at this for quite a long time and um, I don't know that we've yet got any of the answers. But as usual, I've um, got a bit of an agenda and as you'd expect, I'm going to say a little bit about uh, my company Farmex and uh, uh, what we get up to. Um, I'm going to give you, um, if you like, an explanation for how um, our involvement in um, ventilating piggeries sort of led us into uh, information and communications technology. And I'm going to be begging this question about what is the promise of these uh, technologies and, and the important question, how can it be realized? Um, my company is by any stretch of the imagination a micro business it was ever thus um, even at our um, busiest uh, in terms of people we were still only about eight um, eight persons um, we've now been in business for uh, 41 years um, we're specialist control and ventilation engineers and we manufacture in very short batches in fact it's one of the um, really important features of the control system we now mostly make that it is possible to make it in short batches which is very handy uh, because our market is relatively small but it also has all kinds of different requirements so we have a very flexible product we don't have the heavy costs of lots of stock we have uh, 13 dealers uh, across the UK and we've been exporting to uh, the States um, for a long time, since uh, 1996, a business that I set up over there. Um, and it represents about 20% of what we do. Where did it all start? Well, it all started um, and uh, uh, Dan Mitchell's uh, listening to this lecture and he knows very well where it all started because he was sort of, he was uh, certainly alongside it when it was happening and rather supportive of it when it was happening. Um, but it was, it was a bunch of um, university uh, based people, um, five of us. Uh, and so, of course, we got tagged as ventilation boffins. And we came up with this interestingly packaged ventilation system, the so-called hybrid research system. And here is yours truly back in the days when I was um, a little bit more hirsute and certainly had more hair on the top of my head. Um, we were the first um, specialist 
uh, ventilation and control um, equipment supplier in the UK pig sector to uh, introduce microprocessors and uh, this product um, was originally used for rather simple natural ventilation system but went on to become quite an important part of our program. Um, we developed on through uh, a whole range of analog controls and we're headed in the direction of trying to be a sort of a one stop shop for pig producers, particularly um, for all things to do with ventilation and control of ventilation. Uh, we even got as far as uh, distributing some insulation products uh, for a while. Um, and we were certainly involved with um, this uh, particular um, ventilation system, which I'll tell you some more about in, in, in a minute, so-called automatically controlled natural ventilation. In 1990, we um, got involved with uh, what was then known as a teaching company scheme. Um, um, they're now called KTP's Knowledge Transfer Partnerships, but uh, in 1990, it was a, still a teaching company scheme. So a little bit of taxpayer money was introduced to the business. And over two years, we came up with this control system, the so-called DICAM range. And 28 years later, having launched it in 1993 commercially, we're still manufacturing this product. We're still innovating on that platform and um, it has become the most used um, temperature regulation system in British pig production. And we enjoy probably a 5% share of the market in the US swine industry um, with this product. And as you can see, um, it has been um, supplied to the market with uh, a number of uh, own label brands. Uh, this one on the top right is the, uh, is the brand that goes out to the states this is our own version of it and then there's a three examples of, of other brand uh, other own label branding now uh, where we're at right now is just really gearing up to commercially uh, launch the uh, next generation of DICAM controls and obviously um, what we're trying to do is retain everything that we've learned um, over the last 28 years with respect to um, process control for farmers, um, but bring some new innovations to that. Um, App-based access, for example, over the air programming to allow much more ready updating of programs and uh, really facilitate remote technical support. Over the four decades we've been in business, we've seen quite a lot of um, changes to the approach taken to ventilation in livestock production, but in pig farming in particular, which is where dominantly our experience lies. Um, when we got started, it was a very DI situation, and Dan will remember very well that a ventilation system was a pegboard inlet, a propeller fan, and uh, an auto transformer, or possibly a two-stage thermostat. Um, and we went then into a period of um, advice based um, system um, ass uh, assembly. Uh, and that's really where Pharmax got started. We were obviously builders to boffins and knew about ventilation. We were promoting a particular kind of, of system and um, we helped our customers to design their buildings to, to work with this system. We then passed through um, the so-called ACMV age, automatically controlled natural ventilation, excellent piece of work done by the then Scottish Farm Buildings Investigation Unit up in Craigstone, just outside Aberdeen. And uh, that system enjoyed huge success in pig production. Um, but like all fashions, um, we moved on. There's a lot of fashion following in ventilation systems. Um, I can't see all of your faces, but I bet there are a few smiling ones at that comment. Uh, we went into a, a time where we started engineering um, pressure operated or so-called passive inlet systems. Um, 
Uh, we went into then using controlled inlet systems and finally into branded complete package systems. And of course, much of the work that was the foundation of uh, controlled inlet systems was done at Silso. And I'm sure there are those present who remember the individuals involved, but uh, the original high speed jet system has now become the basis of pretty much every ventilation system in, in uh, certainly in intensive livestock uh, sectors. So a few images, uh, these may ring some bells for some of you, but uh, this is actually a, a pig building that's just got a continuous uh, slot, if you like, broken up into centre pivoted windows, which are just open and closed on the basis of temperature. Here's what that sort of system looks like from the inside, and it uh, means you've got a lot of natural light and uh, they're very pleasant places to work. They're silent. They actually work rather better than they <laughs> might have been expected to do with respect to temperature control. Uh, we then moved into these. I hope you can see my pointer here, just ignore this big open window here, that's just an emergency ventilation flap. These plastic PVC so-called passive inlets that when this window is closed and the fans are operating, simply open and close. Um, as a result of the um, uh, pressure difference and uh, gives some um, velocity to the incoming air, which of course the Silso researchers had taught us. If we could inject the air at five meters per second, we could set up a nice stable airflow pattern. Um, we've moved now um, since then to um, a much more a finely, a fine, finer tolerance uh, engineered inlet systems, which are installed either inside walls or up here in the eaves of buildings where you're matching the inlet area to the amount of fan capacity that's blowing the air through the buildings in order to control temperature. Um, and this is a, just a tidied up version of that original Silso work on the high speed jet system. And we find ourselves, we've, arri we've arrived at this point now where we have branded packages. Farmex started in 1979 punting a branded package and we ran out of customers in two years because in those days people were still very wedded to their DIY systems. It interests me that uh, 40 years later um, the market has come to its senses and realised that a full package is probably the right way to go. So we were a little bit ahead of our times and we have been, it's been a characteristic of my business in all of its 40 years. Um, so how did ventilation become part of the start of this association with uh, information technologies? Well, we have been trying to apply this important mantra, and um, I'm sure this will, as you read down the list, um, I'm sure this will clang a lot of bells with you. It's, it's real engineering stuff, really. We've long held that the correct place to start is from the biology. Start from the requirements of the biology, whether those are tubers, uh, grains, uh, or indeed cows, sheep, pigs, chickens, whatever. Start from the requirements of the biology and start from their needs and uh, engineer systems to meet those needs. And, and that includes um, very high quality installation, uh, monitoring and maintaining stuff and vitally improving management understanding of the increasing amount of technology that we're expecting farmers to use. And going into buildings, we obviously were um, dominantly uh, looking at thermal efficiency of buildings. Uh, in fact, I got uh, my uh, postgrad studies ended up trying to put numbers onto buildings, numbers that could be used by the then very innovative Edinburgh model peg that uh, the good Colin Whittemore had been developing. And he wanted a simple score for a building based on uh, thermal efficiency so that he could have that as a term, uh, an environmental term in the um, virtual growing of pigs through modelling. Um, 
I ended up speaking on the same platform as he did in, in September um, um, 2011 when the um, um, you know when the twin towers were uh, were dropped at 9/11, um, and um, uh, interestingly, before we heard news of that, I was uh, able to announce to him from the stage that I'd finally, all those years later, found the numbers that he wanted, and uh, he was quick to tell me that I was a bit late. But anyway, just looking at thermal efficiencies and not what it's all about, of course, what about all these other things that go on in buildings which are pieces of plant, although they're not particularly regarded as pieces of plant by the people that invest in them and use them, which is interesting. Um, but of course, all of you people know every bit as well as I do that you can't control what you don't measure. And so, we were led into concluding that we really needed to um, get involved in monitoring buildings much more closely and that's where uh, where we started with the first generation of DICAM controls. So we started creating um, the answer to this question, what is the promise of having all this information? Well, the promise started in 1996 with the development of uh, this product, um, Barn Report, which was a desk-based system which used in those days dial-up networks to interrogate data loggers that were on site and then um, extract the data, um, decompress it and put it onto a secure website. So we use the internet to um, store and distribute data long, long, long before people were using um, uh, connected systems, uh, online systems. So um, this product uh, was excellent at charting and exporting data for other purposes, but at charting things like room temperatures or temperatures in particular parts of the building. I hope you can see my waggling pointer. Um, measures of uh, feed flow using um, elapsed time meters on auger motors or indeed looking at uh, load cells on feed bins and crucially something we got involved in from a very early stage was measuring uh, water throughput in batches of pigs down here at the bottom. Um, we'll say a little bit more about that in a minute or two. And that original barn report system then developed into an online system, which um, I'm going to show you in a minute. Um, and uh, so you have a network of on-site controllers um, permanently connected, part of the machine to machine revolution, permanently connected to the internet where various processing goes on and um, the uh, end user gets access to that with an online, through the browser with an online login and uses that for decision support. Um, now, we've been blathering away with this since 1997. So um, over a quarter of a century, a quarter of a century, have we been taking data from remote um, agricultural production sites in livestock production. Um, I'm still the owner of a micro business. I'm not yet retired to the Bahamas. I don't drive a Porsche. so. Um, you can see that uh, there's something slightly odd here, given all the excitement about the Internet of Things and the power of data and so on and so forth. And it's why I'm begging the question of you good people. And over all of that time, you know, what have we, um, what have we learned? Well, I'm here to tell you, um, uh, good engineer colleagues, that what we have learned is summarized in those three phrases. Shit happens uh, on a pig farm, shit happens in spades. In fact, shit happens on most agricultural undertakings in spades. In fact, it happens so much that we just take it for granted and it becomes just the blur in the background that we live with. But when you start measuring stuff, you really begin to see how much of it is going on. And it naturally begs the question, is there anything we could be doing about it? It turns out there's lots of normals. Um, you know, there's normal for Norfolk <laughs> and there's normal for Dorset. Um, there's all kinds of normals. We've also learned that however excited 
our academic colleagues can get about doing all kinds of stuff. You're far, far better off just starting from the basics. And in our case, that's temperature, uh, energy, feed, water, possibly growth, but that's really quite difficult to do. But temperature, water, feed, electrical energy use, those are really simple and easy things together. And there's a hell of a lot that we can determine from those parameters. But above all, what we've learned is that the most influential uh, component affecting success or failure is the people involved. We originally thought we were monitoring pigs, wrong. We realized we were monitoring equipment, wrong. What we're actually doing is monitoring people's management of the equipment in service to the biology, in our case, the pigs. So it's people that really determine it all. What are we monitoring? Well, as I've mentioned, water, uh, whole buildings, obviously intensive buildings, less intensive buildings, feed bins on load cells, growing pigs on weighing platforms, sound systems to listen to pigs coughing, um, you name it. Who's doing the monitoring? Well, we've got uh, clearly the intensive uh, pig production sector is uh, doing monitoring. Here's, I hope you can see my waggling pointer. Here is a, um, here is an in-pen weigh scale, but it's not only those people. Also, we've got more extensive pig production systems, straw-based pig production, who are also using the same in-pen weighing system. Uh, because funnily enough, um, straw-based production systems, more extensive production systems, the pigs are still eating and drinking and shitting and growing, and they still go down the same slaughter line to produce the product that you and I would, would like to eat. Um, still talking about the promise here, fellow engineers. So we're integrating liquid feed systems into our products. We're measuring feed order motor runtime to get a measure of, um, of what's going on in these uh, buildings and producing information like this and trying, and this is the key to it, trying to create knowledge. Um, we're looking at tip weighers uh, as another source of data. We're trying to trying to get a sensible measure on the average daily feed intake in, say, a group or a pen full of pigs. We're obviously putting load cells onto, sorry, load cells under feed bins um, and have a measure of that. And of course, with all of these um, uh, um, successful groups of pigs, we can start to build a picture of what feed intake should be like. The experts are, fonding, are fond of um, providing us with feed intake graphs, but this is real data. And so we can create knowledge for a particular, in, uh, particular undertaking. And we can draw a fixed line, the red one, and we can have a look at what's actually going on in real time, the green one, and uh, get a bit of an idea about whether, we're in, whether we are making progress or not. So, Obviously, this is the promise of information that's flowing from livestock undertakings. Uh, water measurement was something we got really uh, very, very involved with early on. And my sadly deceased colleague, Nick Bird, became a global expert on uh, water disappearance in, um, in uh, finishing pig production and came up with an awful lot of the knowledge that we now have. Uh, simple stuff like comparing wastage from different drinkers. Um, looking at uh, feed and water is virtually the same thing. The curves are virtually the same thing. So here's a water curve over a grow out period and we see water intake declining. So this is obviously trying to tell us something. And what it's telling us is that with dietary change, pig feed intake goes off. So what we would have liked to have seen is that nice straight inclining red line that you viewed earlier, but all of this dip here is obviously lost growth. So there's, there's a lot to be learned and we're really only scraping the surface. Um, a wise producer in America observed that um, he, he saw a very rapid decline in water intake. Um, and not long after his pigs started sickening with, um, with swine flu, and so he introduced a new protocol that uh, if he saw three clear days of declining water intake or a very rapid daily drop with no other explanation, he would immediately go in and treat for swine flu 
And uh, he told me one day that that was worth $30,000 to his business and paid for all of the monitoring subscription twice over. So promise, promise, promise. Um, we ended up uh, now, as I've explained to you, with an online system. Um, it has a number of components. It has, a, has a, an alarm generation component, as you would reasonably expect. Um, and um, the notification system is really flexible. You can have the messages delivered by text message, email, or by voice message. And obviously, where we're trying to get to is delivering actionable notifications. Um, one of the components um, is a live feed, a, um, a map of the site. I'm going to show you this in a minute before we come back to the end of the presentation part because I'm keen we have enough time for discussion because I'm <laughs> going to treat you all as quasi-consultants in answering the question about how we realise the promise. Um, we uh, chart the data still within Barn Report Pro, just as you saw the early uh, charting system. Um, it's very, very much more flexible than the original desktop uh, program system. Um, end users can um, end users can set this up how they wish, and we help them do that. Um, we can generate we can generate automatic reports from the data flows, and we do a lot of that for our subscribers. Um, one of the huge challenges, and I know this will ring bells with many of you, is you know we don't have any problem producing streams of numbers. My archive is probably twenty billion records strong. And all of those numbers are not worth a squat until somebody can turn them into knowledge and then into profit. So data reduction or numbers reduction and turning it into meaningful information that people can understand is a really big challenge. And these sorts of reporting formats that can be set up um, exactly how a particular end user likes um, a very important, very important part of that. But and here's where I'm beginning to come to one of the one of the mechanisms for realization of promise is to introduce uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. And we do a little bit of this, but we are we're really, really only at the front end of this. However much you hear about uh, the use of AI, we're really only at the front end of it, certainly in in the livestock sector. Uh, but a stream of numbers which we turn into smiley faces and then we use that um algorithm that scoring algorithm to then start delivering notifications to the relevant operative so hello joe looks like you've got a leak in your water system in finishing shed two how about you go take a look at it that sort of thing and where we're trying to get to where we are trying to get to is log on free log on free benefit from all of this technology in other words it's a system which blathers away in the background um, livestock persons don't have to do anything other than keep their smartphone in their pockets and respond to the notifications and the system is clever enough to realize that if they don't want 83 notifications in a day they just want one or two that are prioritized that um, prioritise, which will allow them to take an intervention, which will immediately have some benefit for the biology, which will immediately have some benefit for the owner, the farmer. Um, tracking growth, um, something we passed over in the photographs I showed you. Um, huge amount of interest and excitement about tracking growth. Has it really taken off in pig production? No, it hasn't. Is it being done using weighing scales? Yes, a bit. That's what we've done. Has the um, visual image analysis work that was also done way, 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 way back? It's also, has that been picked up? Yes, it has. Are there any such systems available? Yes, there are. Do they work more or less? What's the problem? The lenses get covered in fly shit. So there are some really st straightforward constraints. Some of the early systems don't recognize colored pigs and with the more exotic breeds coming in, 
Uh, we've got quite a lot of coloured pigs around. So there's, it's, it's fascinating that a technology that started a quarter of a century ago, the village, um, visual image analysis stuff at Silso, hasn't yet got into just routine, bang, 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 simple use. Huge challenges trying to get all this technology to work in livestock buildings. Promise, promise, promise. Here's a here's a here's a, here's an illustration that I um, that I put together um, <laughs> uh, in uh, 2006 for a um, a fellowship paper that I wrote for the um, the then uh, Royal Agricultural College, now the Royal Agricultural University. Um, so. The idea of having a fully integrated um, IT system, say, for the port chain is one that even I had <laughs> all those years ago. Uh, and have we got there yet? No, we haven't. Is there still an interest in getting there? Yes, there is, but we aren't there yet. Um, so promise I'm still on, um, fellow engineers. I'm just going to briefly end this show and I'm going to just share with you some, it's very easy for someone like me to talk about with some slides, um, a data capture system. Um, I'm a great believer that there are always doubting Thomases in an audience, and I'm not suggesting for a minute any of you are doubting Thomases, but here is some real data really flowing as we look at it from a farm in Oxfordshire, and we've got some feed bin telemetry here. One or two of these look to me to be um, not very not very full of feed. Um, we've got water flow going on. We've got feed flow going on. That's uh, an animated icon showing the um, feed auger motors running. We've obviously got some indication of what the actual temperature is and what the set temperature is. Uh, these set temperatures of 20 degrees in a straw-based building look rather high for me, but that's just my opinion. What do I know? Over here, we've got the Wiener block that you probably would be able to see if I moved you across a little bit. Um, so that's all quite in interesting, I suppose. Um, but if we now look here, um, I always find this, this, this is, excites people more. You'll notice here is the time, it's 7.34 a.m. So we're now looking at a wing to finish production site in Nebraska, in the United States. And, um, this is a, a four-room production site housing about 6,000 hogs um, that are delivered to this site as um, a four-week-old wieners and then grow through to their, uh, to their finished weight. Uh, these buildings have um, sidewall inlets which have got cool cells in them. They also have uh, ceiling inlets. They have pit fans which draw the air through the building from the ceiling inlets and then they have a gable end which looks like the end of a massive Brabazon jet aircraft with loads and loads of big fans, so-called tunnel venting the site. So I hope that giving you a very, very brief look at some real data flowing as we sit and look at it from the other side of the world or across the Atlantic at least, you'll accept that um, that is actually going on. And then I'll finish my uh, presentation and hopefully leave us some time for you to help me answer the question. So all of that is the promise of IT. And I've hinted at um, our, um, one of the, the threads, we've got a divergent thread emerging. We've got um, the thread of, um, um, automating um, the uh, data analysis and it starts from pulling together data sources. Farmers, as you know, don't want to be multiply logging on to many different sites. They want a dashboard where they can see what they need to see. So obviously that's part of realizing, um, realizing the value, part of, uh, uh, of achieving um, the end goal of improving efficiency and sustainability and all of that, and also crucially improving a lot of the biology or the animals. Um, it's also about closing the loop, you know, can we put electronic ID on the ears of pigs and give them a feeding system which knows who they are 
and what feed they need. Will that help us um, realise the potential a bit more quickly? Well, of course, yes, it would. But the dilemma is, and as you can see from the amount of plant here, this is a really, really heavy investment. And over the years, um, pig farmers have not been known for their massive investment in technology. They, they are prepared to invest in that which works for them. But this is a real step up. But it is part of the realisation of value. Um, I've mentioned automation and, uh, you know, looking at pigs one way or another and uh, automating how we are assessing those pigs. Uh, we're all becoming very familiar with the challenge of the absence of labour. So um, very handy, perhaps, to have a system which will do some of the looking at the pigs for us. So that's one thread, one of these diverging threads. And the other possibility is to have um, many more people involved. And I think this is a very, very legitimate alternative. And some of you may have heard of a company called OptiFarm. It's actually, um, uh, it's actually a, a poultry farming technologist called David Speller's company. Um, and based on his background in, in broiler production, he basically has a team of people that are visiting broiler production sites every virtually every 90 minutes, analysing the data, and then if necessary, getting on the phone to the unit manager and saying, you need to take a look at this or that or the other. So it's, it's very labour intensive, but it's obviously uh, in its labour productivity massively enhanced by uh, technology on farm. But it's very much a people based approach rather than um, um, uh, a log on free, fully automated based approach. Uh, some of you may be thinking that this people based approach is just a stepping stone to building sufficient knowledge to be able to automate the whole thing completely. And I think that's a fairly good point. And uh, if, if that's what you think, I'll be absolutely delighted to discuss it, uh, discuss it further with you. But I think perhaps, and my final sort of thing, having uh, described where we've come from and why we've got into what we do and what we do, and just the gobsmacking amount of uh, data which flows off, uh, off a pig production site. For example, every batch of finishing pigs produces half a million observations. Half a million, every batch of finishing pigs. So, We've got tons of numbers, that's not the problem. What we are not seeing is the satisfactory analysis and uh, of those numbers to create knowledge and the application of that knowledge to improve profitability and sustainability. And I come back to this. <laughs> People aren't spending enough money on all this. That's another reason why I'm not yet retired to the Bahamas. But you know, what are the key drivers for investment in technology? And head and shoulders above everything else is ease of use. And I have my hand well and truly up here, uh, fellow engineers. Um, everything I've just shown you is absolutely fascinating to the likes of you and me because we're into this sort of stuff. Basically, for our prime producers, it's all far too bloody complicated. That's it. It's just too complicated. So we've got to rise to the challenge of making it less complicated. And is that by automating it all, or is that by getting people involved to act as a bridge between the technology and the prime producer? And needless to say, I think agricultural engineers are perfectly qualified to provide that bridge. But ease of use is what it's all about. Um, clearly all these other things are important, but it's got to be easy for people to get value. And right now, it isn't easy enough. OK, thanks for that, Hugh. Um, so we'll just start the questions. Uh, Tim, Jamin has a question. Tim, do you want to unmute? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if I understood or misunderstood. You were saying about image analysis, Hugh, not, not being used very, very much. But presumably, farmers do monitor the weight gain of individual pigs, particularly if they've got a, a breed, uh, an on-site breeding program, otherwise, how would they know which which offspring are doing well and which aren't? In um, in uh, breeding production, uh, yes, boars, 
um, are on test and uh, the so-called fire stations that are built have weigh scales on them so they monitor feed and growth rates uh, in breeding animals absolutely correct in commercial finishing pigs pretty much nobody me nobody measures individual pigs at the moment there's uh, a little bit of engagement with um, um, average weights of groups of pigs that's where that's where we're at right now um, it is amazing that the um, uh, blindingly obvious measurement of um, production in finishing pig and uh, finishing big production, you know, the weight of pig, live pig meat that you're putting on a truck to send to, to market. Um, farmers don't uh, get involved in that. Some do, some have way, some have uh, way platforms for, um, you know, bridges for, for the wagons, but they basically um, get a kill sheet from the process and that tells them what they've delivered and how much they've been paid for it. Disappointing, I know, but it's the truth. Um, I've, I've got a question. Yeah. With the, there's obviously so much focus on, on the environment at the moment. Have you been asked to look at um, emissions monitoring and that sort of stuff from, from livestock buildings. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, measuring um, uh, ammonia is something which is uh, coming into play, uh, largely because uh, as the regulatory bodies become um, more tooled up with regulation and more influential, um, as we move from um, essentially a food production supported agricultural system to one uh, courtesy of Brexit, which is actually going to be uh, public money for public goods. And obviously one of the public goods is the maintenance of the or improvement of the environment. So there's a lot more interest in things like emissions. And uh, the challenge of course, is the instrumentation for all of that. We have a data capture platform, very long established. Uh, we are measuring uh, ammonia levels on one or two sites, but it's not a normal thing yet. Um, it will, as time passes, become more normal um, because it'll have to be, uh, because people will be hoping to justify um, public money for public goods along, the, along that basis. It is a matter of um, frustration for me that um, apparently food production is not seen as a public good. Okay, um, any more questions from anybody? You must have baffled everybody, I well, thank you. Well, I can't believe that. Can I you were you were looking for some yeah. some feedback from us of, of what we were thinking. Can you Indeed. elaborate on exactly what what it was you were looking for? Well, I asked the question: How can the promise of all this information technology be realised? And um, I suggested that um, one methodology would be to uh, automate all the data analysis. Uh, which is beginning to happen, but which is by no means, um, comp there is no done deal system in livestock production at the moment. The most invested sector is dairy. Um, people like to think poultry is highly invested. It is reasonably invested, but, they, but the headline system there is the people-based adding of value. So I suggested that one way is to um, automate data, uh, data analysis and so it, to make it easier for people to get at the value, all they have to do is uh, wait for the system to manage the people for them. Um, and the other methodology is to have a lot of people involved in talking to other people and uh, helping to bridge that gap between the technology and its and the, the information and its application in the agricultural undertaking. So I was hoping that uh, in the audience there might be one or two people who got um, 
either similar insights or similar experience um, or indeed have um, you know got a couple of solutions up their sleeves from from my experience within the within the dairy sector um, I used to work for, for Fullwood on uh, milking robots um, and one of the things that, that we kept on coming up against was we can't automate everything um, and the reason for that is we can't we can't get the system to act as a vet um, so we had systems to be able to, um, there's systems out there to be able to automatically medicate, there's systems out there to, to change God knows how many different things, whatever you want to do, effectively you can automate. Um, the problem is, how do you make sure that that automation is correct? Um, and one of the simplistic ways of getting around that is put forward suggestions. Now, rather than trying to automate the system and go, okay, we, um, for example, on the on the pigs, it would be potentially um, that um, you, rather than getting them to look at the data and then understand what's going on, it's going, well, you've got a problem here. These are the potential issues. Go and investigate. So if you're giving the farmer a direction of, of where to go and look and what, what kind of things he should be should be checking up on um, these. Are the Absolutely. So actionable notification is what you're talking about. The the swine flu um, thing that was identified in America, that to me um, shows the, the extreme value in all this monitoring in, in that if you can identify links between well, here it was just a, a, a reduction in the amount of water being consumed. Is that what it was? Yes. Um, water is a very rapid indicator of a back off in feed intake because water and feed in, in growing pigs is pretty much the same curve. Um, if you see water backing off, what it means is that the pigs have backed off eating. And if the pigs have backed off eating, it's usually because they're not feeling very well. And often that indicator arrives before the stock person observes it. Yeah, that that, that to me is, is a is well that particular farmer identified a very significant value to him, um, and that that to me is where all this technology needs to be targeting. It needs to be identifying the data that exists already. Needs to be identifying where links can be found, and once the links can be found, you can then concentrate these the data sensing to to trigger for those things and, uh, and unfortunately right now I I think we're probably still in the investigation phase trying to find these links and and it's if as, if as yes you've got 40 years of data um, but is uh, and a lot of other companies will likewise have a lot of data and not all of it is being cross-referenced and thus we're not finding out the various links that already ex exist that just haven't been identified. I think it'd be fair to say none of it is being cross-referenced. There's lots yeah. of exciting talk about getting the data out of these silos and making sense of it, but not very much of it's happening. Robert, who do you think should be paying for all this investigation? Um, government should government grants and things like that is is is, is pretty important because we've got to feed the nation. If 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 we're trying to get more food out of the land we've got, yet we're trying to build on some of this land. <laughs> We got to be able to. We, the government's got to compensate for the fact that um, the the food, more food, needs to be produced, and we're only going to do that by avoiding wastage, uh, water wastage, huge problem in, on farms. Um, if you can be told that there's a leak before before it's got bad, you can save the problem. Certainly, I, I do have a farm. I'm I'm a patent attorney by trade, but I have a farm with a tenant on it, and we've had a leak on the farm now for 15 years and we can't find it. <laughs> we've dug trenches. We've, we, but unfortunately we don't actually have a plan of where all the pipes are because um, they were put in 50 years ago. So we've replaced a lot of them, but trying to work out where leaks are, that, that's, that seems to be quite tricky. I think with, um, with, with regard to funding it, um, it would be looking to the likes of Innovate UK, which is obviously getting the fact um that would be able to give grants out and, and stuff and things like this but ultimately it's it's not going to be down to the farmer or down to the government it's going to be down to the down to the, the companies who are actually producing technology in the sector um to be able to to, to approach 
um, bodies like in the UK to, to try and get that grant. Um, it's, ultimately, it's all going to come down to commercial. If you haven't got anything commercial, then you're not going to get any, any backing or, or any effort involved in it. One of the problems does seem to be that farming itself only becomes profitable with the very, very, very big farms, unless if you have secondary incomes. And as a result, the, the people on, on site who are developing technologies don't have the funding themselves to be able to take their product forwards. And I, I disagree with that. Do you, well, I, um, particularly when you, when you look at dairy, some of the most profitable farms, um, um, when you look at, at profit, profitability per, per head, um, some of the most profitable farms in the UK are 120 cow dairy units, which on the average herd size, that's fairly small. But the, I, I don't know what numbers would be on, uh, I don't have dairy at home, I've only got uh, arable and sheep. Um, but I, I, we're, what are we, we're 300 acres. And I know that my farmer, he certainly wouldn't be able to afford a worldwide patent portfolio if he happened to have an invention because that's going to cost him over 200 grand over the next three or four yeah, years. But that's, but that's an invention. Um, that's, that's taking it outside of agriculture. Well, it's not, because if, if you have a development in technology, you, you need to protect it so you can commercialise it and, and, and profit from it. Otherwise, people just steal it. So that's, that's the difficulty is the, 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 the small businesses, you can't, you, the kind of numbers you're needing to be able to get anywhere without external help it's it's just so difficult for them that's that's certainly the experience we see and we it's not just agriculture we see it we see it in in many technologies it's it's the smaller companies really struggle to protect their inventions well enough in order to be able to go to the big boys and sell it it was uh, never a problem we had um i don't have any patents um on any of our products um we um took the view that uh, we'd be better off just being bloody good at exploiting the uh, the stuff that we'd done, and um, so <laughs> maybe I'm the uh, exception that this proves the rule, or, or, or possibly the exception that proves the rule. I don't know, but uh, not we... not at all. It's a very it's a very viable route forward, and and, and in the, certainly in the UK, it's almost the majority will approach it in that that way. Hmm. Uh, if you go to the likes of Germany, it's the other way around. The majority will go for patents. Um, uh, whether the German firms do any better or not, I don't think there's data to suggest they do. Um, but there certainly isn't the data to suggest they don't. But it, it does have to come down to person. If you happen to have a windfall and you could have afforded patents, you might have gone for it. But if you don't have the money to do it, you wouldn't. Um, and it's just, that is a very simple decision to take, but the difference being is if you have the patents, even if you yourself can't penetrate, what was your number, 650K? Yeah. Uh, even if you, you yourself can't penetrate that, if you could have licensed to another company who could have taken it elsewhere, so around the world rather than just the US, which obviously is brilliant, well done, um, that that's where revenues start to come in with patents because you can now get licensing fees where you're doing nothing and still getting paid yeah no I, I, all uh, very clearly understood uh, the, the starting point of course is that a patent's only worth the money you can afford to protect it absolutely and, absolutely and of course if it would need to be part of the licensing agreement that the licensee was actually doing that fighting for you you will i'm sure you're aware of the uh, the workbench man who um uh, who uh, had, had a patent and uh, then spent the rest of his life, um, you know, on the side. I mean, he did very well out of it, obviously, thanks to Black & Decker, but he, uh, he uh, spent an awful lot of his uh, time then just uh, fighting uh, patent contraventions by mostly Chinese companies, is it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here we've got, uh, we've just got a couple of minutes left, you. Um, did I read that you'd had some tie-up with the AgriEpi organisation? Uh, yes, I'm a member of um, that Centre of Excellence mm -hmm. and indeed the CL Centre of Excellence, uh, both both of them. Um, and obviously, the, I, 
I'm glad it, we've only got two minutes because you're just about to get me started on one of my hobby horses. But one of the <laughs> one of the the original agri agri tech strategy was was was, was a great idea, and there was about ninety million quid of public money that was uh, used to prime the pump. It was supposed to be industry led. And when I say industry led, that, that you know, prime production industry led and allied industries around prime production. Of course, what happened, and I may be revealing a bit of a prejudice here, what happened was that the academics recognized there was a trough to get their teeth into and waded in. And so it, it's been dominated by, um, uh, in my opinion, by, uh, by academia. Now, whilst there's nothing particularly wrong with that per se, um, it's ended up being um, not, com not commercial enough in, in my view. So, um, you know, what, will, what defines success for these centres of excellence? Well, in my book, what defines success would be farmers knocking the door for uh, help, information and knowledge to do their job better because through that door, there's good, solid commercial work going on with the collaboration of technology suppliers and farmers to make this technology really work and really answer the questions that I'm posing today. Because little old me have, you know, I can hint at the answers. I understand uh, the two threads that I've specified, but it needs organizations like the centers of excellence to really get commercial with this stuff. And um, if I may make a really bold and controversial statement, Early on in my uh, lecture, I was talking about the need to keep it simple, start from the basics. And unfortunately, um, academia has tended to be talking about uh, integrating technologies which are so far down the road from current agricultural practice that it actually puts people off. It actually, oh, well, I'll, I'll wait till they've got that sorted out before I join in. Well, for goodness sakes, let's get on and start getting some value from easy stuff first. Then the farmers themselves will have some extra cash to invest in this stuff, because that's been my problem. If, if more people had invested in IT, if more farmers had invested in IT, which, by the way, they are now beginning to do. But if more farmers had started to invest in IT, even a decade ago, I would have been delivering a completely different lunchtime lecture today. I'd have been showing you really cool shit that was doing all kinds of stuff for farmers without them even having to get out of bed, you know. Yeah, was, I mean, the reason I asked is, is I'm aware of some of the, the dairy um, stuff that AgriAppy are doing, and we've had yep. presentations from some of our guys on that subject, but I've not seen anything on, on pigs and poultry and that side of it. Uh, the, which, Leeds, the Leeds farm um, is... Which I'm sure there is, yeah. It's sure. the pig unit. But, uh, well, there's, mm. a, there's a DICAM 2 control system, there, yeah. the dairy unit that's, agri you know, the dairy unit you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. OK. All right, well, it's 2 o'clock, so we better draw it to a close. There is a question, well, there's a remark from Alan Plum. Is he, oh, he's still there. Do you want to ask, Alan? I thought you'd disappeared. And then I'll wrap up. Yeah, I'm, I'm still here. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Hello, Hugh. Uh, that Hi, was excellent. Yeah. And, and the discussion has been great as well. And, and good. Uh, officially wearing my Douglas Bonford Trust secretary's hat. There's good, good meeting there to uh, push students um, forward and, and research. But anyway, no, uh, just a lighthearted thing to say. Um, when are you and your fiddler friends um, in Feast of Fiddles coming back to Milton Keynes? We're desperate <laughs> to see live music again, especially yours. Uh, right, well, bear with me two seconds, and I will not only tell you that A, that we uh, are coming back to um, uh, Milton Keynes, to the stable, uh, <laughs> next year, but B, the uh, address that we're doing that is Tuesday the 5th of April in the year of our Lord 2022. <laughs> we'll be there, along with Dave Tinker and your, your other fans in my part of the world. Uh, meanwhile, if there's any if there's any people here present that are anywhere near pool on uh, Friday of this week, uh, Feast of Fiddles will be appearing at the Lighthouse Pool at 7.30 on Friday. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Brilliant. Are you going to be right. anywhere near Leicester? Because I'm moving up there at Christmas. How funny one. Yeah, probably not until 2023. We're going to be at, going to be at Loudham, I think, the village hall there, which is reasonably close to Leicester. But, yeah. <laughs> That's me, sorry. Thank you, Charlie. Thank okay, you. right. And, and I'll thanks, everybody. I've got a dash. All right. Oh, thanks, for, thank, <laughs> thank you, Hugh, for that excellent presentation. Uh, thanks for taking the time to do that. I know you're really busy with the with the challenges going on in the pig industry at the moment, so it's very appreciated. I'm yeah, sure people found it. Yeah. Um, other hands are up, mind you. Too late now, I'm afraid. Ah, ah, well, much done. So I'd like to thank you all for joining us today and hope you'll join us for our next lecture on the 14th of December, where we'll be joined by Colin McCrasher from the BSI to talk about the development of a code of practice for crop robots and autonomous ag vehicles, which I know a number of I agree members are involved with that. So all that's left today is left to say is thanks again for that. And uh, we'll see you next time. Okay. Bye-bye.